I certainly appreciate uh, my friend Mr. Graves a real problem and we've seen it in Louisiana and not just in southern Louisiana but other parts of Louisiana with massive flooding and I'm not even talking about Katrina but there was a massive amount of waste under Hurricane Katrina that also affected my district in East Texas. I have a 120 mile border that I share with something called Louisiana and uh, we've seen the same problems. We uh, have had a flood, a massive flood of Caddo Lake, one time the largest natural lake in America, um, but natural, largest freshwater natural lake besides the Great Lakes. But uh, a natural dam apparently was exploded many years ago, but it's still one of the great treasures of the state and our country. And it had a massive flood. And I was visiting over uh, in Karnak, Texas, uh, last week with uh, some of the emergency, local emergency people that are trying to take care of the issue. And the local folks there in Harrison County are acting very responsibly. The local government has acted responsibly. But you have outrageous things like my friend Ms. Graves was talking about. One uh, family, for example, they got a loan to buy uh, a new mobile home that wasn't destroyed like the last one with the flood and been too much water. So they got a new m mobile home and got the loan. Well, as we've heard with FEMA, in this case, there were um, requirements that the mobile home be lifted higher, the elevation had to be much higher than where it was, and in the process of lifting it up, the mobile home fell and completely destroyed, and they still have to make payments on their mobile home for the loan, and they have no home. Uh, they were doing everything within their power to comply with the governmental requirements. And uh, other bureaucratic nightmares, uh, I was hearing stories about how some of the churches in East Texas banded together and the Baptist men uh, came in and did amazing work. And yes, I understand they're women too, but I think they call themselves the Baptist men, but anyway, they came in and did extraordinary work. And when people didn't have any plumbing, they had nothing. They brought in portable showers and restrooms and, and provided the help long before v FEMA could get there and do what was needed. And to hear people who were so affected by a massive flood say, if we ever have another disaster like that, before we call FEMA, we're going to call the Baptist men because they come in and they get stuff done. They help people where it is, and they don't care who you are, all of your background information. They see who's hurting, and they help them. Well, that's the way it used to be, but then we became too reliant on letting the government fix everything because there were people in the federal government that realized if we can make the federal government the ultimate insurer of everything. Your school, your home, your uh, flood insurance. We'll start small, but we'll work up until maybe one day we can even have the government behind everyone's health insurance. Because if you really want to take away people's freedom, you really want to have big brother government dictating every aspect of your life, the way to do it is have the government ensure all those aspects of your life. Because once someone has the right to, to pay in the event uh, that you are harmed, then they have the right to tell you how to avoid them having to pay. And there goes your freedom. So 
the more power of insurance that has come to the federal government, many thought, oh, we can give up some of our liberty just for a little more security. But Benjamin Franklin, with all the wisdom that man had, he, uh, he understood back then, basically those who are willing to give up liberty for security deserve neither. And for too long in this country, people have been giving up their liberty in order to get security only to find that they're not even secure, just like Mr. Graves was talking about. Uh, you know, we thought, gee, if we set up a federal emergency management agency to help take care of emergencies, it will be fantastic. If we will set up a Corps of Engineers to help with our water projects, it will be fantastic. If we set up an EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, to protect the, the world, the environment, it will be a great thing. But the longer these agencies exist, the less sensitive they are to what they were supposed to do. We found it right here in the Capitol. About seven years ago, the architect of the Capitol, who works for the House and Senate, had decided that we all work for him and uh, started making demands, uh, one of which was I could not cook ribs and share them with other members of Congress, as I'd been doing for a quarter, once a quarter. And there were most of the networks had wanted to do stories on my cooking ribs. And I said, no, we're not going to do a TV thing on this. This is just between the members. Well, I am grateful that uh, Steve Scalise got involved and he got uh, Paul Ryan to help. The speaker was able to persuade the bureaucracies here on Capitol Hill that we can make this work and have it safe if, you know, we work with each other and was able to get people to work together so that my colleagues, they tell me, many of them, they're the best meat they've ever tasted. Some say the best ribs they've ever tasted. And I have enough of my late mother in me that I enjoy cooking and enjoy people enjoying uh, what I cook. It, it's probably the only time here on Capitol Hill when I actually leave a good taste in people's mouths instead of a bitter taste. But as we continue to see abuse by the federal government, and we, then we see abuses going on across the country, we think, well, in the federal government, even though it's badly abused its authority, isn't it supposed to protect us from other abuses? And the answer is yes, if they're federally related. Well, when you have the Electoral College and electors elected as part of that uh, system, it is critical that that be a protected system of voting, just as the Constitution would require, and as the law actually requires. So this story by Hans von Spakovsky and Jennifer Mathis says, uh, before Donald Trump's stunning victory on November 8, liberals call for acceptance of election results. But since the election didn't go as they planned, some have taken to harassing and intimidating electors in an attempt to change the election results. Some of these threats may actually violate federal law, yet the Justice Department acts strangely uninterested in investigating, which takes us back to having people armed with billy clubs standing, trying to intimidate voters at their place of voting, and the Department of Just Us, which was supposed to be justice, said, no, 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 that's fine for them to do it. 
No, there's no problems with them doing that. If anybody else were to do that, yeah, we'd probably go after them, but these are the new black party or such as that. So, yeah, it's fine if they do it. We have got to get back to being a nation where the laws are enforced evenly across the board. And if the laws don't make sense, like our own rules here on the Capitol Hill, if things do not accommodate people fairly and equally, they're just arbitrary decisions like we got from the architect of the Capitol when the uh, visitor center was being built or when people are just wanting to uh, have a life up here. We should be stopping the bureaucrats and getting rules that apply across the board, fairly across the board. Yes, here we make the rules, and we should have rules that apply to everybody. But when you have an arbitrary dictator, um, they don't get applied quite so evenly. But here we have the Justice Department, and uh, these re this report of electors that are going to be voting very soon in the Electoral College to elect the president, and their very lives are being threatened. Some of them have had to move their families. And this Justice Department is not interested in protecting the integrity of the election. That's the problem we've been suffering for quite some time around the country. They were not interested in enforcing the law fairly across the board. Um, so we end up all the worse off for it. Uh, this article goes on to say um, in Georgia and Idaho, it's become so extreme that the secretaries of state both released statements calling for the harassment to end. I absolutely know without doubt that if Hillary Clinton had won the election as the rules set it up with a Republican form of government, little r, not the Republican Party, but a Republican form of government, just as Ben Franklin said when he was asked after the Constitution was finally came together with what most of the members of the Constitutional Convention said was divine providence or the finger of God without the finger of God being involved. They could never have come up with that constitution. Franklin says, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. So we had found and our founders had wisely, so many of them sought truth in scripture, a Bible that they would use to argue positions, and they realized probably a complete, perfect democracy is not best for governing people because if it's a true democracy, then the law gets changed on whims. If someone becomes the object of scorn, and it's a true democracy. They're not governed by laws um, that um, you that we currently have in our Constitution, which indicate you can't have ex post facto laws. You can't make a law criminalizing things after the act has already occurred. Our Constitution guarantees, uh, it guarantees against that. Well, in a perfect democracy, there is no such uh, ex post facto law. A majority can make a decision to criminalize conduct that previously occurred so that when the person committed the act, they were not violating the law. They were acting in accordance with the law, and it was later changed. Um, of course, we have had people violate the ex post facto law, like uh, President Clinton shoved through in 1993, uh, taxes on Social Security, 
taxes on money that had already been earned under different rules of taxation. That was a violation of the Constitution that was not um, thrown out, but it was clearly a violation of the Constitution. So those things do happen even in a republic. But with a republic, as the founders gave us, this idea of liberty could take hold. It wasn't just might makes right, somebody powerful intimidate the rest into voting to string you up or to throw you out of the, the community. No, you had to abide by existing laws and your conduct, if appropriate under the law at the time, could not be changed to punish you for something that happened before it was a crime. So there's so much wisdom in the Constitution. And that wisdom is being cast aside, but that wisdom gave us the Electoral College, without which you would never see the presidential candidates going to all the different states. They would never go to all the different cities that they have because the elections would be decided by the big urban areas and you can look on the map that shows uh, most of them have red for Republican, blue for Democrats. Uh, years ago it was the other way around. Red depicted Democrats, but since so many of them were uh, becoming socialists, they were offended that the red made it look like they're red communists. So somewhere along the way, can't find who decided to make the color change, but more started making red Republican and blue Democrat. Colors don't matter. Uh, but if you look at the counties that voted for Hillary Clinton, you quickly see that she was a fringe candidate. She was fringe on the West Coast, the big cities on the West Coast, a fringe candidate on the East Coast, the big cities on the fringe of the nation, fringe up in the very north, the big cities in the very north, uh, fringe along the southern border, and uh, basically just a fringe candidate, which I guess would make the Democratic Party, when you look at who voted for the Democratic candidate, you'd have to say the United States. You have the Republican Party uh, that apparently, according to the votes of the majority, represents over 90 percent of the geographical United States. This other party, this fringe party, that represents the fringes around the edge of the country, basically. And, you know, there are a few larger in the middle, but uh, they're a bit of an anomaly because mostly what we see is a fringe candidate and a fringe party. So it'll be interesting to see where we go from here. Obviously, we have a Justice Department that is not interested in protecting our Constitution, protecting uh, the election process as they are mandated to do. And frankly, when you have a Department of Justice that selectively enforces the law and so totally disregards other parts of the law, then um, they're really not a Department of Justice. And if this administration had continued on, then we would seriously need to look to provide a more appropriate name for the Department of Justice because this is not, it has not been a Department of Justice. When you look at what appear to have been crimes committed by IRS personnel, like Lois Lerner, perjury committed before Congress, crimes across America, uh, as my friend John Fund wrote in his book about uh, illegal voting. Uh, one of the, as I've heard John Fund say, perhaps the biggest fraud in America about our elections 
is the fraud that has been telling people that there is no illegal voting going on there is certainly illegal voting going on and many have chosen to look the other way but a majority of the geographic and majority of the a lot like toral college elected electors indicate they want the law applied across the country fairly section eleven b of the voting rights act makes it a crime for anyone to quote intimidate threaten or coerce or attempt to intimidate threaten or coerce any person for voting or attempting to vote while this has been applied in the past to ordinary everyday voters in federal elections the language does not limit it only to such voters electors who are casting their votes for president and vice president are also protected by section eleven b since the electoral college is an essential part of the federal voting process this is supported by section fourteen c of the order of the voting rights act which says that voting includes all action necessary to make a vote effective in any primary special or general election unquote obviously the votes cast by americans on november eight will not be effective if the electors they chose are intimidated from casting their votes in the electoral college federal law which is three u s c section seven requires electors to cast their votes on the first monday after the second wednesday of december which this year is december nineteenth these are recorded as certificates of votes signed sealed and delivered by december twenty eight to the president of the senate and the archivist of the united states congress or united states required to meet on january six joint session to count the electoral college votes and as we know from so much of the lamestream media like cnn msnbc there was outrage when donald trump said he wasn't sure he couldn't say beforehand that he wouldn't have questions about the outcome of the election if there were indications of massive fraud in the election but as we heard from the lamestream media uh... oh that would threaten the very foundation of this country uh... it would destroy uh... the basis for this country it, it was just such a threat to our very existence well now those same people that said those things are according to they themselves they are risking this country they're putting the very foundation of our country at risk and we all know know now some raised this during the election but it was not clear until a recount began to be demanded by a third party candidate but we can now say clearly the evidence is in and i used to try felony cases as a judge for that years before that as a prosecutor um, we can now rest our case jill stein was nothing more than a sham candidate for hillary to help hillary clinton try to pull votes away from others to help hillary clinton win the election clearly that is what she was some suspected that some raised that issue and now obviously she has no chance of winning anything in a real nothing she has no chance of winning anything after a recount so clearly the only reason she's doing it is to continue her effort to help hillary clinton become president despite the will of the american people uh, through the electoral college through the law as it was designed and set up uh, electors across the country should not be getting threatened the justice department should be outraged but they're not they're not bothered in the least that the lives of the electors who will decide the presidency 
are being threatened and that that a constitutional crisis is at hand it shows yet again why over ninety percent of the except for the fringes americans have said we want to change we want america that can actually move toward dr king's dream of people being uh, judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I hope and continue to pray that we will get there. Uh, this quote in the article, the U.S. Justice Department, which is charged with protecting all voters, should act, should act to quash this outrage immediately. Obviously, they're not interested in quashing an outrage. They have done more to stir up racial disharmony in this country. They have done more to supplant and subvert the intent of the Constitution, the clear meaning in the Constitution. And I cannot wait to have an administration that will at least make an overt effort to enforce the law as it exists. The president, in his first term, told people over 20 times, I can't just do amnesty. That has to be done by Congress. Somebody figured out after his first term, it appears to be when it really kicked up heavily, Look, who will stop you? Sure, it's against the law. Sure, it's against the Constitution for you to do amnesty, to do executive orders that that take away or rewrite laws that were passed by House and Senate, signed by another president. You just write them like any good monarch would. Who's going to stop you? Somebody figured out to present that to the president. It had to be what happened because he had said so many times he didn't have the power to do what he ultimately started doing. And you realize, gee, that's right. Uh, the soon-to-be-leaving Harry Reid will surely protect President Obama from the, the Senate allowing anything that follows the law coming out of the House to enforce the law. The Senate will be able to stop it. So if Congress wants to cut off funding for what the president's doing illegally, the Senate Democrats will protect the president and protect his illegal conduct. And so you won't have to worry. You can do whatever you want. Amnesty was often granted by not even an executive order. It was granted by a series of memos by the Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson. Uh, so he rewrote the law with memos. Uh, so it will be nice to get back to having enforcement of the law because this article yesterday from Paul Bedard says um, a United Nations mix of illegal immigrants are now flooding through the U.S.-Mexico border, especially from Haiti and Pakistan, raising concerns of terrorism, costing Americans billions according to a new report and Senate testimony. Um, and it, they have a quote here from my friend, uh, Representative Henry Cuellar from Texas, Democrat, but a great man. He said it is because people from different parts of the world, Africa, Middle East, other parts of the world, are now realizing that if that all you have to do to get to the southern border is get to the southern border of the United States. And there's a process there. You can claim a legal defense. You just get to come in. I mean, people, the smuggling organizations, know exactly what they're doing. And as the Border Patrolmen have told me during late hours, early mornings, talking to them out on the border, uh, the drug cartels control every inch of the Mexico-U.S. border. Uh, they do so from the Mexico side, but they control what happens on the U.S. side under this administration. And we saw routinely there were groups that came across 
who were not threats criminally, but they either wanted jobs or they wanted U.S. welfare. And they knew that under this administration, we would not turn them back and say, no, you cannot in illegally. They would not interdict and enforce the law. They would say, come on in. We have some questions to ask you before we give you a slip of paper, send you on your way, or house you, or, as some of the Border Patrolmen said, you know, we end up sending them wherever they want to go in the United States. They call the Border Patrol logistics. They get them to our side of the border, and we ship them anywhere they want to go. So it's no wonder that we would have a request for this administration asking for billions more money to uh, process folks. Uh, I know there $2.2 billion was mentioned, but I saw another article where it lists the different components that the administration wanted to do. You add up all the different requests and different ways that this administration wants to use the money from American taxpayers, and it is to take money away from Americans who are here legally, who are working, who are struggling to provide for themselves and their family, take their money away and give that to people who are coming in illegally. Now, there was a law I found out about in England and visiting with some of their Social Security type folks in their government. They have a law that you're supposed to be there for five years contributing to that Social Security type system for five years before you can ever make a claim for a dime of it. Now, I hear there are abuses of that system uh, because they may not have the best control. For it, but it is a system that we have in this country, some other countries. You're taking money from people that earned it and giving it to people who are breaking the law. If you do that long enough, that place that at one time was a shining light on the hill, goes broke. The light goes out. And once that happens in America, as friends from other parts of the world have said, if you lose your freedom in America, the rest of the world has no chance. And you realize historically, a United States of America where people will go fight for freedom. They'll create strength, a strong economy in their own country, strong enough because they enforce the rule of law across the board and become strong enough economically that they will go shed their blood, spend their money to get freedom for people who are suffering under the forces of evil. Every now and then you have a president like Jimmy Carter who will say, let's get rid of the Shah, and then welcomes the Ayatollah Khomeini as, a, as he said, a man of peace, which opened Pandora's box. Radical Islamists had been put in a box for many decades, but President Carter was complicit in helping because he's a well-intentioned man, a good man, well-intentioned. Yeah, maybe a little anti-Israel, but uh, he wanted to help folks. And out of his ignorance on radical Islam, he for the time in many decades placed radical Islamists in charge of a massive military and a whole country. And since then, the world has been paying a very heavy price for what happened. So uh, we have a job to do. We took an oath in this body to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And as Donald Trump was saying yesterday in Ohio, our devotion is to one, our oath is to one country. We say a pledge to a flag. Well, that used to be true. It used to be 
that people learned enough history. I loved history. People like Coach Sam Parker inspired me to love history. And we learned it. And we knew what it took to keep a republic, madam, if we could. But kids, because of federal intervention in education, we've not helped our suffering schools. We have made them subjects to this master federal government. You do what we say or we don't send you any of the money you sent to us. We'll fix up our offices. We'll fix up the massive bureaucracy. And we will dictate to you of what Congress says. They're not as bad as the Corps of Engineers, the EPA, FDA has been recently. But they've really not helped as I said to President Bush, as Secretary of Education, very nice person, but she had helped Texas schools when she was in Austin. But when she came here and disregarded the Tenth Amendment and the Constitution that did not enumerate education as a federal power, and so it was reserved to the states and the people, she began ask, acting unconstitutionally and as I explained to her you know you 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 ought to come to Gladewater Texas there's an amazing school there that helps between 100 120 130 special needs kids one of them if, if he touches something shiny he's had a big day and you mandate that they have to do a test for that child we had a child at St. Louis School in Tyler, told her she needed to come visit because they had as a goal that by the end of the year, this young man would be able to stick a fork in a piece of food and get it to his mouth. The goal they believed was reachable. But because the federal government was involved and they say, you don't get any of the money you sent us from Texas unless you do exactly what we say, that was not allowed. They allowed an alternative test that if he could point to a sticker that had a picture of food on it by the end of the year, then he would pass the text and that school would get back money from the federal government that those Texas taxpayers had sent to it to siphon off for whatever they wanted. So by the end of the year, that young man, special needs, severe special needs, he was able to point to a sticker that had a picture of food, but he could not feed himself. That is the kind of insanity that's only gotten worse over the last eight years. I thought a silver lining to President Obama being elected president was at least He's going to end No Child Left Behind because that would mean returning the power to the, step, the states and the people that knew what they were doing. Two years ago, we, we were far more, uh, far higher in the studies of the capabilities of school children. We have dropped. We're not doing so well. And there may be improvement one year over another. But if you really want to leave no child behind, then you need to stop coddling the, the teachers unions and coddle the teachers by letting them do what they know is best, subject to local control. And if they're not doing their job, you don't have to go begging to Washington or a teacher's union. You can go to the school board. And if the school board won't do the right thing, you can run against them and get elected and then fix it yourself. When Sonny Bono in California ran up against a city manager that was so bigoted, he would not let Sonny have 
the license to open his restaurant. That's how he got involved in politics. He found out who hired and fired the city manager. It was the mayor. So he ran for mayor. The first thing he did was fire the abusive city manager. That's how a republic system is supposed to work. It's a form of democracy, pure democracy, so that we can have ex post facto laws. We can pe keep people from having their conduct criminalized after they committed it. But we have got to hit the ground running at the first of the year and start the process of trying to heal America. President Obama did not make the school system better. He made matters worse. We had a voucher program here in D.C. that minority kids, actually it's a minorities or majority here, minority elsewhere, these poor kids suffering from a broken school system have more than enough money to properly educate the kids, but kids were the victims of the bureaucracy. What else has this Justice Department done? Well, they've gone around and stirred up racial tensions where there shouldn't have been. They stirred up rumors that, for example, if you were a black young man in America, you're 20 times more likely to be shot than if you were a white person in America of that same age. It's simply not true. And we saw different parts of the country when we had a black mayor or black police chief. It's not a racist. It's not out to harm blacks in America, but try to do justice by them. And they ultimately found, in most cases, that had been brought, actually the police were justified in what they were doing. Since police are con uh, composed of human beings, there's going to be some rotten apples. When I was a judge, I saw one every now and then, very, very rarely. But every now and then you did. And I would contend that from my experience handling thousands of uh, felony cases, that the law enforcement officers I dealt with have a much tinier percentage of problems than the general population of America. When we find a police officer who is abusive, who is problematic, he or she should be punished. But after 9-11, America was jarred awake for the first time in decades to really beginning again to appreciate the job law enforcement officers have done for us to keep the peace, to allow us not to be beat up by a bigger bully in our block, but allow the law to be enforced more equally and fairly. It's never perfect. There's always room for improvement. And people began to appreciate our first responders without contempt because they were stopping traffic. And they began to appreciate our military more because it was willing to go lay down their lives for their friends, for the people in this country, which Jesus said was the greatest love. And he absolutely knew he laid down his life for us. But in the last eight years, we have become so racially divided The regret I have from going back to Mount Pleasant is that the most choked up I got going back to my old high school that was so good to me, so good to me, did such a great job public school educating me, my brothers, my sister. Uh, I love Coach Willie Williams, and I saw him after so long and got a hug, just touched deeply. And somebody said, did you take a picture? And I didn't think about a picture. I wasn't thinking picture. Here was a man that coached me who would not put up with anybody using race. It didn't matter to Coach Williams. 
He expected us to perform. I wish I'd gotten a picture. I got to. I got to do that. What a great man. Well, unfortunately, we have other information. There was a damning Department of Homeland Security report that exposes the administration's claim that as many as 81 percent of people attempting to cross the border illegally were apprehended. From the port, we find out that actually it uh, is not anything like 81 percent. It may be more like 54 percent. Uh, shockingly, the report's authors find that the estimated apprehension rate between ports of entry in 2005 was only 36 percent, and that was 2005. It has not gotten better, even though tricks of adjusting the statistics have gotten more uh, multiplied. We have got to defend our nation. We have got to enforce the law. We have got to keep this country as a shining get it back to being a shining light on the hill instead of one to overwhelm by people who want to violate our law and bring us they don't want to do it but failing to enforce our borders will eliminate our ability to be the most generous country when it comes to visas and legal entry no country though other countries are massively larger in size geographically, in size population-wise. No one awards more visas than we do, over a million. And yet, that will end up coming to an end as the failure to enforce the law, as we particularly, it, there were problems in the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, Bush administration, right, uh, um, administration before that, but it has just gone exponentially crazy under this administration, and we got to get it under control. One other thing, I continue to hear some in America say, the days of the United States being a manufacturing powerhouse are over. Well, I know from history, and apparently Donald Trump knows from just his business instincts, that if a strong country cannot produce the things it needs to defend itself and defend freedom, then it will cease being a free country after the next significant conflict. It's just a fact. And in the Battle of the Bulge, so many don't realize that even as late as that occurred in World War II, it had a good shot of, of prevailing and the Allied forces from the bulge in the middle out to the water's edge. But they, one of the most uh, fundamental problems was they ran out of fuel. Well, East Texas was the largest known reserve when it was discovered, and it provided plenty of oil. Our tanks had fuel. But as we became more dependent on other countries, that became a problem. But American ingenuity has allowed us to find more natural gas, more oil. And now a new find out in West Texas, natural gas is far cleaner. And I hope and pray under Donald Trump, we'll move to use more of that. But if we don't get back the factories, and we didn't just lose them from the Rust Belt. I lost a, a lot of steel plants, but Lufkin Industries, it got bought up by GE. They didn't care about Lufkin. They, didn't, they weren't going to sponsor any Little League Kings. They didn't care. They just bought them up, took their patents, and they told me their headquarters for that operation was in Italy, over in the Mediterranean. This is the company that doesn't pay us taxes, but the head of it is close friends with the president. Well, it's time we got back to manufacturing steel in America, steel pipe in America, manufacturing what we need to make tanks, planes, cars, buses, 
do that here. It's time we got back jobs to make paper. We have renewable resources here we've quit using. They're not sequoias. They're not redwoods. They're pine trees. They grow back every 20 years. You can find pictures of places in East Texas where there were no trees. And yet after the timber industry came in, they became forested again. We become great again, but we have got to be more responsible. We have got to protect our borders from those who want to do us harm and violate our laws. And if we would do that, a 10-year-old little girl in my county would be alive today. I yield back. The chair would entertain a motion to adjourn. This time I would move that we do now hereby adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Accordingly, the House stands adjourned until noon on Monday next for morning hour debate. And that wraps up work in the House for the week. Only one issue came to the floor today, and that's the 2017 Defense Programs and Policy Bill. Members approved the House-Senate compromise version of the bill. The vote on that was 375 to 34. That bill now goes to the Senate for consideration, and if approved, it would be sent to President Obama for his signature. We will have more live House coverage when members return next week here on C-SPAN. The Labor Department released the latest jobs numbers today, and employers added 178,000 jobs last month, which drops the unemployment rate from 4.9 to 4.6 percent, and that is the lowest rate since 2007. House Ways and Means Committee Chair Kevin Brady said in a statement related to that, while I'm glad to see more gains in employment, it looks like the unemployment rate fell in part because many people gave up looking for work. We need to create more opportunities for all Americans. And House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi also said in the statement, Overall, November's jobs report shows the economy is moving forward. However, for many communities and families across America, the story is different. Too many Americans feel deep anxiety about their jobs, their wages, and their future. As Democrats have said, Congress has a responsibility to create more good-paying jobs, raise workers' wages, and ensure that no community is left behind. Be sure to join us later today when the Israeli Defense Minister and the Egyptian Foreign Minister will be speaking at the Brookings Institution's annual Saban Forum. That event seeks to bring together American and Israeli leaders from government and business, and that will be live at 6.30 p.m. Eastern on our companion network, C-SPAN 2. And Cuban leader Fidel Castro passed away late last month, and earlier this week there was a memorial service in Cuba for him. Join us tonight at 8 Eastern for remarks from Raul Castro, that's Fidel's brother and the current leader of the island nation. And again, you can watch that at 8 p.m. Eastern here on C-SPAN. Later on, we'll bring you the oral argument from the Supreme Court on immigration detention. In the case of Jennings v. Rodriguez, the court will decide if detained immigrants facing deportation can be held for longer than six months without a bail hearing. You can see that oral argument tonight at 8 Eastern, also on C-SPAN 2. C-SPAN Student Camp Documentary Contest is in full swing, and this year we're asking students to tell us what's the most important issue for the new presidents and the new Congress to address in 2017. Joining me is Ashley Lee. She's a former Student Camp winner of 2015 for her documentary, Help for Homeless Heroes. Ashley, tell us a little bit about your Student Camp Documentary. Yes, yeah, so in 2015, my partner and I produced a documentary where we cover the issues of homeless veterans on the streets of Orange County, California. Um, we decided that these are the people who have fought for our country, who have given their all for our country, and the fact that they are now living on the streets, not having family, not having anyone who care for them, were not okay. So we decided that we are going to talk about this issue within our community, and we decided to make a C-SPAN documentary about it. I encourage all seniors, I encourage even juniors in high school, even middle schoolers to use this platform to speak your voice, to raise your voice, to, to say that your generation deserve to be heard in the government and if there is a better place to speak these issues. I think my advice for the students who are on the fence of starting this documentary is 
uh, to really look into your community and see what is affecting those who are around you because they are the one who you love. They are the one who you see the most. They are the one who you surround with almost every day. And so if there is an issue that you see happen every day on the street, that's probably where you can start. Be a part of this documentary because you want to be a voice for your community. Thank you, Ashley, for all of your advice and tips on Student Cam. And if you want more information on our Student Cam documentary contest, go to our website, studentcam.org. And now to an update on the situation in Afghanistan. You'll hear from Army General John Nicholson, commander of U.S. forces in the region, who briefed reporters earlier today. His comments, followed by a question and answer session, are just under an hour.